You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to the 315th episode of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. The first thing we wanted to say in this opening section is that you can either think of this as the last episode of the campaign part of the story arc, or you can think of it as the first show of the battle part of the story arc. As Rich mentioned in the last show, we're splitting up this epic story arc into four parts. The campaign, the battle, the retreat, and the Gettysburg Address. In this episode, the two armies will continue to move toward a collision at Gettysburg, and we'll end the show with the first shot of the battle on the morning of July 1st, 1863. Okay, well, when last we left Robert E. Lee, the spy Harrison on the night of June 28th had told him that the federal army, rather than still being massed below the Potomac, as Lee had assumed, had actually crossed the river three days earlier and was now well up into Maryland. Lee doesn't seem to have been panicked or even greatly alarmed by this news that the enemy army was only a hard day's march south of the Mason-Dixon line. After all, one of the reasons he'd struck north into Pennsylvania was to draw the Yankees after him. But what did trouble Lee was that he was hearing vital intelligence about the whereabouts of the Army of the Potomac from a spy rather than from his cavalry chief, Jeb Stuart. Robert E. Lee had come to trust Stuart to be the eyes and ears of the Army. Never before had Stuart let him down. And so the dashing Southern Cavaliers' failure here at such a critical moment was disturbing, to say the least. Lee still hadn't heard from Stuart since he set off on his ride back on June 25th. Even now, Lee had no idea where Stuart was, nor any idea of the whereabouts of the enemy's forces beyond what the spy Harrison had just told him, and that information was already 24 hours old. With Stuart missing in action, Lee realized he had no choice but to act on the spy's news and act quickly. Lee immediately dictated orders that would bring his scattered army back together. The place he chose as the army's assembly point was the small hamlet of Cashtown, east of South Mountain, between Chambersburg and Gettysburg. You see, the spy Harrison's report had made it seem as if the Federals, down in Maryland, might, maybe, be getting ready to lunge west across South Mountain to threaten Lee's mostly theoretical line of supply and communication back to Virginia. Really, as he was conducting his grand raid through southern Pennsylvania, Lee didn't have much of an actual line of supply and communication in the traditional sense, but he still couldn't afford for the Yankees to cut in behind him. So Lee decided the best way to keep the enemy from lunging west across South Mountain was to unite the Confederate army east of the mountains at Cashtown, about eight miles from Gettysburg. And that's pretty much where we left Robert E. Lee last time. Up until this point, Lee's campaign had exhibited all the markings of a huge raid, that is, marching virtually unopposed through the enemy's country, 
gathering up much-needed supplies along the way, and perhaps bagging a northern state capital in the bargain. But now, now Lee's campaign took on a more ominous character as the Confederate commander began to assemble his army in preparation for a major battle. As we related previously on the podcast, Confederate Second Corps Commander Dick Yule, who had been preparing to strike across the Susquehanna River and capture Harrisburg, had received those recall orders from Robert E. Lee on June 29th, telling him to break off his advance and turn back to reunite with the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia at Cashtown. Meanwhile, Lee would get his other two corps, Hills and Longstreet's, marching eastward from Chambersburg and across South Mountain for the rendezvous with Yule. A.P. Hill's Third Corps led the way, and Hill's lead division, commanded by Major General Henry Heath, arrived at Cashtown by day's end on Monday, June 29th. Eight miles to the southeast, down the Chambersburg Pike, was the town of Gettysburg. The next day, June 30th, Heath directed his senior brigadier, James Johnston Pettigrew, to march his brigade down the Chambersburg Pike to Gettysburg to search for supplies. And this might be a good time to point out that the Confederates' foraging efforts never ceased during the campaign. We've talked before about the importance Robert E. Lee placed on the organized gathering up of supplies for the Army, and so we won't belabor the point here, except to say that those efforts never stopped. Even during the three days of battle at Gettysburg, there were Confederate foraging parties out miles away, gathering up food, fodder, and supplies from the Pennsylvania countryside. While Pettigrew's brigade from Heath's division went off to Gettysburg to search for supplies on June 30th, A.P. Hill's other two divisions, those of Richard Anderson and Dorsey Pender, would be coming up to Cashtown. Meanwhile, the divisions of James Longstreet's 1st Corps would be just behind, although Pickett's Virginians would remain at Chambersburg to guard the Army's wagon trains, since no rebel cavalry was available to perform that task. When Pettigrew set out for Gettysburg, he was under orders to return that same day and, according to his aide, Lieutenant Lewis Young, told that he was, quote, not to precipitate a fight. End quote. It was thought that an enemy home guard unit might possibly be at Gettysburg, and although the Confederates had learned that the threat presented by Pennsylvania militia was slight, Heath nevertheless told Pettigrew that he should not engage, quote, any organized troops capable of making resistance or any portion of the Army of the Potomac. Pettigrew's brigade numbered more than 2,700 men and was the largest in Lee's army, although on June 30th, Pettigrew would depart from Cashtown with only three of the brigade's four regiments, along with three pieces of artillery. And because no rebel horsemen were on hand to accompany the column, Pettigrew would advance toward Gettysburg without the benefit of a cavalry escort. 34-year-old Johnston Pettigrew was more a scholar than a soldier. Born into a wealthy North Carolina family, he attended the University of North Carolina, where he made the best grades ever recorded at that institution. After graduating at the age of 19, he was appointed to an assistant professorship at the Naval Observatory in Washington. When he decided to take up law, he ended up traveling to Germany to study. He traveled extensively in Europe and became proficient in French, German, Italian, and Spanish with a reading knowledge of Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. He spent seven years abroad writing a well-regarded travel book on Spain, as well as spending time in diplomatic service. After returning to America, Pettigrew practiced law in Charleston, South Carolina, and was elected to the state legislature in 1856. With the sectional crisis moving toward a shooting war, 
he was elected colonel of a Charleston militia outfit. The unit took part in the siege and bombardment of Fort Sumter in the spring of 1861. Eventually made colonel of a North Carolina regiment and then elevated to brigade command, Pettigrew was severely wounded at the Battle of Seven Pines during the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. He was taken prisoner and then exchanged, and that fall and winter he commanded a brigade in southern Virginia and North Carolina, but saw little action. At the end of May 1863, his brigade and another were added to the Army of Northern Virginia and assigned to Heath's division in Hill's Corps. Johnston Pettigrew wouldn't make it to Gettysburg on June 30th. Two Confederates who had gone into town ahead of Pettigrew's column, E.B. Spence, Heath's division surgeon, and the spy Harrison, came flying back to tell Pettigrew, quote, that a superior force of the enemy were moving on Gettysburg, end quote. Pettigrew himself saw some mounted men ahead, Union cavalry. Pettigrew halted his advance and sent a message back to Harry Heath, asking for further orders. Heath's reply repeated his earlier instructions not to become involved in any fighting, but also expressed doubt that there was anything other than militia in Gettysburg. Well, Johnston Pettigrew wasn't a professional soldier and had had only limited combat experience, but he was one smart cookie and was sure that he could tell the difference between some amateurish home guardsmen and real enemy cavalry when he saw it. And these Yankee horsemen in front of him on the outskirts of Gettysburg were certainly acting like they knew what they were doing. So, obeying his orders not to precipitate a fight, Pettigrew turned around and withdrew back toward Cashtown. The Federals that Pettigrew spotted near Gettysburg on Tuesday, June 30th, were cavalry troopers commanded by Brigadier General John Buford. Buford's division was scouting ahead of John Reynolds' left wing of the Army of the Potomac. Unlike Robert E. Lee, George Meade was very well served by his own mounted arm as it screened the Federal Army's advances north through Maryland and into Pennsylvania. Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick's division screened the Army of the Potomac's right flank, while Buford's division did the same on the left. Artilleryman Colonel Charles Wainwright spoke for many when he expressed the opinion that the 37-year-old Buford was, quote, decidedly the best cavalry general in the Army of the Potomac. Buford's no-nonsense, all-business attitude was reflected in the way he carried himself. A member of Meade's staff described the hard-fighting Buford as a, quote, compactly built man of middle height with a tawny mustache and a little triangular gray eye whose expression is determined, not to say sinister. He is a soldierly-looking man of good disposition, but not to be trifled with. Buford was born in Kentucky in 1826, but raised in Illinois. He attended West Point and graduated in the upper half of the class of 1848. Assigned to the Dragoons, he saw his first combat in 1855, fighting the Sioux. He went west with the Mormon expedition and stayed in Utah until the outbreak of hostilities in 1861, when his regiment marched 1,100 miles overland to Washington, D.C. Buford's friend and fellow officer, John Gibbon, who stayed loyal to the Union, but had three brothers who would serve in the Confederate Army, recalled that, quote, One night after the arrival of the mail, we were in Buford's room, talking over the news, when Buford said in his slow, deliberate way, I got a letter by the last mail from home with a message in it from the governor of Kentucky. He sends me word to come to Kentucky at once, and I shall have anything I want. Realizing the pro-Confederate governor of the Bluegrass State wanted Buford to turn his back on the Union, 
An anxious Gibbon asked his friend, What did you answer, John? Buford said, I sent him word I was a captain in the United States Army, and I intend to remain one. However, Buford's war career got off to a slow start. In the summer of 1862, when John Pope came to Washington to take command of the Army of Virginia, he was surprised to find Buford in a staff position in the Capitol. Pope saw it to it that Buford was promoted to Brigadier General and gave him command of the Reserve Cavalry Brigade in his Army of Virginia. Buford was one of the few officers to come out of Pope's disastrous Second Bull Run campaign with an enhanced reputation. He showed real skill at reconnaissance operations and consistently provided Pope's headquarters with timely intelligence about the approach of Longstreet's Confederates to the battlefield, which Pope unfortunately ignored. During the actual battle of Second Bull Run, Buford ordered a charge against rebel horsemen. During the clash, he was badly wounded in the knee. The wound incapacitated Buford until the next year, but in the meantime, during the Antietam and Fredericksburg campaigns, he acted as cavalry advisor to Army commanders George McClellan and Ambrose Burnside. When Hooker consolidated the Army of the Potomac's cavalry into its own corps in February 1863, Buford returned to command of the Reserve Brigade. And just a footnote, but the Reserve Brigade, despite its name, was actually considered something of an elite formation, as it contained the regular U.S. Army cavalry regiments assigned to the Army of the Potomac. Anyway, although Buford performed well in the Chancellorsville campaign, Cavalry Chief George Stoneman's raid took him away from most of the important action. Afterwards, when Hooker replaced Stoneman, Buford was considered as a replacement, but the top cavalry spot ended up going to Alfred Pleasanton, since Pleasanton's General's Commission predated Buford's by a month. Hooker later admitted that Buford would have been a better choice, but at any rate... At any rate... Buford was given a division in the Cavalry Corps. At Brandy Station on June 9th, Buford's division fought a mainly defensive battle on the St. James Church section of the battlefield. But then, as the Gettysburg campaign developed throughout the following couple of weeks, he was again energetic and invaluable in reconnaissance, passing on crucial information about the enemy that went largely unappreciated by Pleasanton. As Meade moved the Army of the Potomac North toward the Pennsylvania line during the last days of June, Buford's mission was to cover the Army's left wing, which was under the command of John Reynolds. On June 30th, the three infantry corps that comprised the left wing were reaching their destinations at both Marsh Creek, just across the state line, and Emmitsburg, just below the state line, while Buford was to push farther north to Gettysburg, where he would continue to gather information and better fix the location of the Confederate Army. With two of his three brigades, under Colonels William Gamble and Thomas Devon, Buford set off for Gettysburg, arriving there to a hero's welcome at about 11 a.m. on the 30th. The townspeople, who had been alarmed by the approach of Pettigrew's Confederates from the West, and whom Buford described as being in a quote-unquote terrible state of excitement, were immensely relieved when the federal troopers rode into town from the south and the rebels withdrew. Overjoyed that they had been spared another terrifying visit by the enemy, like the one that they had already experienced on June 26, when Jubal Early's Confederates arrived in town, The citizens of Gettysburg now gave their deliverers an enthusiastic welcome. Crowds lined the streets, cheering, waving flags, singing patriotic songs, and offering up bread, baked goods, and water to the dusty horsemen. Ten-year-old Charles McCurdy scrambled atop a fence to get a better view of the friendly horsemen. As he later recalled, these blue uniformed and well-equipped Union troopers provided, quote, a strong contrast to the rebel cavalry I had seen a week before, end quote. 
15-year-old Tilly Pierce joined a group of girls who tried to sing the battle cry of freedom, but she admitted, quote, as some of us did not know the whole of the piece, we kept repeating the chorus. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. As some of you may recall, way back in the first episode of this story arc, when we said that Gettysburg would end up being the largest and bloodiest battle of the Civil War, we asked the question, what brought those 165,000 men to Gettysburg during the first three days of July, 1863? And the literal answer, of course, is the roads. The soldiers of both armies came to Gettysburg, riding or marching, on the roads that converged on the town from all points of the compass. The town of Gettysburg sat neatly at the intersection of the east-west roads that linked Philadelphia and Lancaster with all points westward in Pennsylvania, and the north-south roads that connected Harrisburg on the Susquehanna River with the town of Frederick in Maryland, and beyond that, the Potomac River. What that meant was that people traveling through south-central Pennsylvania would, sooner or later, most likely find themselves funneled through Gettysburg. The town itself was physically centered on a large square, called locally the Diamond, with the most important buildings on it or nearby. Civil War Gettysburg was about three-quarters of a mile north to south and around one-half mile east to west and its streets ran almost exclusively on a north-south, east-west grid. The primary streets entering the Diamond were named after where they came from. Carlisle Street headed north, York Street headed east, Baltimore Street went south from the Diamond before veering to the southeast in front of Cemetery Hill, and Chambersburg Street headed west. Like the spokes of a wheel, ten major roads radiated out from Gettysburg in all directions. Two of those roads were macadamized, the Chambersburg Pike and Baltimore Pike. The macadam process used layers of small stones to make an all-weather road that may have been good for carts, but was a bit rough on the feet for walking on. In 1863, the 2,400 residents of the thriving Crossroads town which had about 450 buildings, could boast of being the county seat of Adams County, having three weekly newspapers, 
six hotels and taverns, seven churches, nine law firms, 11 carriage makers, and two institutions of higher learning, Pennsylvania College and the Lutheran Seminary. Most of the buildings, at least near the diamond, were made of brick. Houses generally didn't have front yards, but were close to the streets, as they are today, with brick sidewalks. There were a number of alleys behind the houses, and most buildings had horse sheds or stables and fenced-in backyards. As John Buford rode into Gettysburg with his 2,700 Federal horsemen late on the morning of June 30th, he probably couldn't have cared less how many carriage makers or churches were located in the town. But what he would have certainly noticed and cared about was that Gettysburg sat at the center of that web of roads, and that it was also surrounded by ground well suited for defense, particularly south of town, the direction from which the Federal infantry would be arriving on the scene. Immediately south of Gettysburg, the landscape and its features would come to define the famous Federal Fish Hook defensive line. At the northern end of the Fish Hook were Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill, just outside town, forming the Hook. From Evergreen Cemetery atop Cemetery Hill, the terrain sloped southward and downward to reach almost ground level at its southern end. This was Cemetery Ridge, which would be the mile and a half long shank of the fish hook and the backbone of Meade's defensive line. At the southern end of Cemetery Ridge, the ground rises abruptly to the two elevations which formed the fish hook's eye rugged little round top, and the taller, big round top. John Buford, a well-trained and seasoned cavalryman with a good eye for terrain, would have certainly noted those features of the ground immediately south of Gettysburg as he rode into town from that direction on June 30th. And after arriving in town, he would have carefully scouted the other nearby terrain, especially to the west, out the Chambersburg Pike, where the Confederates had approached Gettysburg that morning before withdrawing. Buford would have seen that the ground west of Gettysburg rose and fell to form a succession of roughly parallel ridge lines, each running generally north-south and each bisected by the northwest-southeast running Chambersburg Pike, as well as by an unfinished railroad cut, which ran parallel to the pike 200 yards to the north, and which in places was 20 feet deep. Nearest to Gettysburg, three-quarters of a mile west of the Diamond, was Seminary Ridge, topped by the buildings of the Lutheran Seminary. The ground sloped downward from there, bottoming out in a broad space before it rose again to form McPherson's Ridge, named after the family whose large farmstead cut into the western arm of the ridge line. A 17-acre woodlot, known as Herbst Woods, stood atop this ridgeline south of the McPherson House and Barn. Continuing westward from McPherson's Ridge, the ground again sloped down to Willoughby Run, a meandering stream that ran along the western base of the ridgeline. Three quarters of a mile farther west, the ground rose up once more to form Hers Ridge, named for a tavern that crowned this ridgeline. To the north of the Chambersburg Pike and north of the railroad cut, Seminary Ridge became known as Oak Ridge, topped by Sheeds Woods, and then rose to form Oak Hill, the highest point north of Gettysburg and a dominating military position. All in all, it was ground well suited for Buford's designs, because the next day, July 1st, he planned to mount a defense in depth, with his troopers holding each of those successive ridge lines west of Gettysburg for as long as possible before falling back to McPherson's Ridge, where he would establish his main defensive line. John Buford was sure the Confederates would be returning on Wednesday. Therefore, his goal in mounting his defense in depth on the ridge lines west of Gettysburg would be to hold off and delay the rebels long enough for the Federal infantry of Reynolds' left wing to arrive on the scene. Buford knew that Tuesday night his nearest supports lay just five miles to the south of Gettysburg, near Marsh Creek, 
where Reynolds' own 1st Corps went into bivouac. The other two corps that made up the Army's left wing, Oliver Howard's 11th Corps and Dan Sickles' 3rd Corps, were a few miles farther south, near Emmitsburg. The rest of the Army of the Potomac was spread out some 25 miles farther to the east and just south of the Mason-Dixon line, stretching from Emmitsburg through Tawnytown and toward Manchester. But Buford knew that John Reynolds was close at hand and that Reynolds would be marching for Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st. And so, although Buford had fewer than 3,000 men to make a fight of it at Gettysburg, the veteran cavalryman was determined to hold off the Confederates long enough for Reynolds and his infantry to arrive. He would then leave it to Reynolds to decide whether Gettysburg would be a good place for the army to fight a defensive battle. In making his dispositions that Tuesday night, Buford explained his thoughts and intentions to his brigade commanders. Colonel Devon boasted that they would be able to hold back any rebels that Lee threw their way come morning. Buford snapped back, No, you won't. They will attack you in the morning, and they will come booming, skirmishers three deep. You will have to fight like the devil to hold your own until supports arrive. That Tuesday night, John Buford set his picket lines, or vedette lines, as they're called when it's cavalry, but Buford set out his vedettes to cover all the major roads leading into Gettysburg, from the north, east, and west, from the York Pike over to the Fairfield Road. Meanwhile, in the Confederate camp at Cashtown, Johnston Pettigrew was briefing his division commander, Harry Heath, on the results of his foray toward Gettysburg. In later years, Heath would recall the conversation with several variants, but what seems indisputable is that Pettigrew told him he hadn't made it to Gettysburg, as there was evidently a large force of Federal cavalry occupying the town, and there was some indication that Union infantry might be nearby. As Heath and Pettigrew were talking, A.P. Hill rode up. The Corps commander listened to Pettigrew's story and then declared that what he had encountered was only, quote, cavalry, probably a detachment of observation, end quote. Hill said he had just come from talking to Robert E. Lee, and the best information that Hill had from Lee put the closest major federal formation almost 16 miles farther south, or about a day's march away. Pettigrew, who had simply obeyed his orders not to engage in any fighting, was frustrated that Hill and Heath were now smugly second-guessing his decision to turn back from Gettysburg. Pettigrew called over his aide, Lieutenant Young, who was known to A.P. Hill, thinking that Young's words would carry some weight with the Corps commander. But Hill still refused to believe any portion of the Army of the Potomac was at Gettysburg. At this point, Heath spoke up, saying to Hill, quote, If there is no objection, I will take my division tomorrow and go to Gettysburg. A.P. Hill thought for a moment. Did he have any objection to Heath going to Gettysburg on July 1st? None in the world, he answered. In fact, Hill would order a much larger force to march toward Gettysburg, not only Heath's entire division, but also Dorsey Penders as well, which would boost the total to 15,000 men in all. A.P. Hill would later report that he simply, quote, intended to advance the next morning and discover what was in my front. Hill's decision to send 15,000 men on a scout toward Gettysburg is a curious one to say the least. Normally such reconnaissance is the job of cavalry, but... Are you beginning to sense a theme here? With Jeb Stewart missing in action, Hill would be sending out two full divisions of infantry to discover what was in his front. At any rate, when Hill notified Robert E. Lee that he would be advancing a large force toward Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st, Lee approved but repeated his standing orders not to bring on a general engagement should the enemy be found, 
since he didn't want to fight a battle until the entire army was concentrated. Okay, well, and so it was that with A.P. Hill marching two divisions back toward Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st, and with John Buford determined to resist any Confederate advance toward the town, the stage was set for the ball to open. Early morning on Wednesday, July 1st, 1863, two privates of the 8th Illinois Cavalry were stationed several miles northwest of the town of Gettysburg, where the Chambersburg Pike crosses Knoxland Ridge. They were part of the picket line that Union Brigadier General John Buford had positioned to guard the roads leading into Gettysburg. One of those troopers manning the vedette post on the crest of Knoxland Ridge, Private Thomas Kelly, later recalled how, quote, The weather had been terribly hot and dry, and we wondered as we sat in our saddles if we were in for another scorching day. From our orders, we did not expect to march that day, and believed we might come into contact with the enemy, though of course we troopers did not know where he was. Well, Kelly and the other trooper manning that post didn't have to wonder for long about the whereabouts of the enemy because around 7 a.m. they spotted a cloud of dust rising up in the distance. Not long after that, the first soldiers at the head of a column of marching Confederate infantry stepped into view on the next ridgeline to the west. Kelly set his spurs and rode off to sound the alarm, but he couldn't immediately locate Sergeant Levi Schaefer, to whom he was supposed to report, so he decided to ride to Lieutenant Marcellus Jones, the officer in charge of the vedettes, who also happened to be Private Kelly's cousin. When Kelly rode up and breathlessly announced that they had sighted the enemy, Jones sent a courier off to headquarters to report the news of the Confederates' approach. Then he mounted his horse and galloped with Kelly back to the sentry post on Knoxlin Ridge. Lieutenant Jones watched as the column of Confederate infantry approached from the west. By this time, Schaefer had arrived on the scene, and Jones borrowed the sergeant's Sharps carbine, rested it on a fence post, and sometime around 7.30 a.m., squeezed off a single shot at a rebel officer across the way riding a light-colored horse. When Jones fired, the head of the enemy column had almost reached the stone bridge spanning Marsh Creek about a half mile away, and so the rebels were still well beyond the carbine's effective range, so he almost certainly didn't hit anything. But nevertheless, 33-year-old Marcellus Ephraim Jones had just fired the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Gettysburg, The Confederate High Tide by Champ Clark and the editors of Time Life Books. We thought we'd use this episode's book recommendation for a sentimental favorite. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of Civil War books, but have to admit we still have a soft spot for the titles in this old Time Life series. It's still just a pleasure to sit down and page through them. You can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. As we wrap up the show, we want to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade for their support of the podcast, and they are Matthew, Pete, and Paul. And thanks also to Andre S. for his donation, and thanks to Jeff and April for their gift. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope that you join us again next time as we look at the fighting on the morning of July 1st between Buford's Union cavalrymen and the advancing Confederates. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.